Hey friends, welcome back to the Winning Digital Customers Show. I'm Howard Tierski. Our topic today, why doesn't marketing work anymore? I've heard from a lot of people uh, over the last maybe couple of years and maybe in an accelerated way, I'd say even during COVID, the feeling that a lot of types of marketing don't work the way they used to. And I want to talk a little bit about why, because I think from the work that I've done seeing a lot of different companies and how they're approaching this thing we call marketing. Uh, what is it that is working? And what is it about a lot of kinds of traditional marketing that have kind of stopped working? And I think from being able to observe lots of different patterns across lots of different companies, I have some insights I'm going to share with you about why certain things aren't working and what it is you can do about it. So first of all, let me start by saying this term marketing, you know, to me, it's kind of a weird term. What does it even mean anyway? Uh, there are some things that I think we would all agree are marketing. You send a brochure to your customer, that's marketing. You you put a TV ad up, that's marketing. So there's stuff that I think everyone would agree is marketing. But when you look at the activities of the marketing department of many companies, it can encompass, encompass all kinds of things. At some companies, all of e-commerce is in the marketing department. And in some cases, none of it. Or in some cases, the marketing department is in charge of uh, understanding the whole customer journey and customer experience through all touch points. And in other cases, that's not part of their responsibility. It's another department, or sometimes it's nobody's job. So even what we mean by marketing today is kind of a nebulous term. But let me tell you what I mean when I talk about marketing not working anymore. And let me just start by just making a distinction very rapidly. And some of you are probably familiar with this, but you know, sort of in this world of marketing, we often think of two, two key types of marketing. And one type of marketing is uh, direct response marketing. And, you know, different people probably have different definitions, but I would say direct response marketing to me is any kind of marketing that's meant to, to get you go buy something. You know, here's a car I'm advertised on TV, special financing rate, Labor Day sale, come this weekend, buy a car. I would argue that is essentially a form of direct response marketing. Obviously, an internet ad where you're supposed to click and buy with your credit card right now is, of course, a form of direct response marketing. Uh, you know, historically, your very first forms of direct response marketing were a lot of direct mail, where they'd send you something in the mail, order now, you fill out the card, you, 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 you enclose a check, you know, you mail it back. I mean, that was the good old days, right? So, but direct response marketing is essentially designed to drive a specific action or behavior. It's supposed to tell you, you should go do this. And direct response marketing, of course, can still be effective, but a lot of times of direct response marketing have stopped working nearly as well as they used to. I'm gonna tell you the second main type of marketing, and then I'm gonna talk about them together because a lot of the reasons why marketing is working a lot less well it, are similar across both types of marketing. But I just want you to think about these two domains. So that's the first domain. And the second domain is brand marketing. Um, and brand marketing is when you're not necessarily trying to get someone to buy this particular product right now, but you're trying to create an awareness of a brand. A classic example of brand marketing would be the old, I'd like to buy the world a Coke television commercial. In fact, a lot of uh, soft drink marketing is brand marketing. Uh, you know, they're not necessarily saying, get in your car right now, go to the grocery store and buy a bottle of Diet Coke, but they're trying to create an emotional connection between you and the brand. They're trying to communicate what the brand is all about, what the brand stands for, so that hopefully the next time you are in in a mode of buying that type of product, you have a positive affinity towards the brand. So it's less about getting you to do something now and more about planting a seed so that when it's the next time you're gonna buy, you have that enhanced brand impression. So those are sort of the two main types of marketing. And you know, a lot of the traditional approach to marketing is what some people have called interruption marketing, marketing like a TV commercial that's meant to sort of find you wherever you are and say, wait, wait, I know you're here to watch an episode of, you know, Star Trek, but first you have to hear about our new, you know, coffee or our new, you know, diet, diet, uh, a new, a new light beer or whatever it is. So um, that's a lot of the classic approach to marketing. I mean, that's really your classic marketing, right? Which is, Hey, we either want to get you to buy something. We want you to appreciate our brand and we're going to find you and we're going to interrupt whatever else you're doing to tell you our message. So that is the kind of classic marketing. And that is the type of marketing, whether it's done in the digital world or in more traditional media, is what I mean when I say that marketing doesn't seem to work anymore, or at least in many cases, doesn't work that well anymore. And so why? So let's talk about the three main reasons why traditional marketing isn't working so well anymore. Uh, 
there's our guy who's thinking about why it doesn't work so well anymore. The first, and I believe this is the number one reason, is cynicism. A lot of traditional marketing is essentially telling the customer why they should buy your product, what you want them to know about you. We have the highest quality, the purest water, the most accurate thermometer, the, 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 you know, the most friendly accounting services, whatever it is. Somebody has strategically determined what is it about your message that we think will get someone to buy your product or your service. And let's tell them. Let's create a television commercial, maybe in an entertaining way, but let's tell them what that is. And here's the problem. Many, many studies have shown that while people may never have believed everything they saw in advertising, uh, the cynicism and disbelief of claims made by advertisers is at an all-time high, and particularly millennials and younger, are extremely cynical of anything they hear in an advertisement. Someone tells them something in an ad, and first of all, because they've been so bombarded with advertising now, it's not like the old days where, you know, you might watch a show and you might see a few ads. Now ads are everywhere, right? Not only on the side of buses there. I was at the supermarket the other day. There were ads on that um, that conveyor belt, you know, that, <laughs> that you put your groceries on. There were ads there. There's ads on the floor in, in Grand Central Station. You just walk along. And it wasn't enough that the walls are covered with ads. They're now covering the floor with ads. They're projecting ads. Studies have shown that people go through the course of a day and they see thousands of ad messages. And of course, in order to survive, their brain has just concluded that these things are unimportant and largely filtered them out. So that's part of the cynicism. It's the cynicism of saying, these messages are irrelevant to me. I don't need to pay attention to them. And then there's the additional cynicism that when people do actually see or read a message, very often the first thing they think is, yeah, BS, right? I don't necessarily believe that. Example I like to use all the time is when you see a United Airlines commercial and it says, fly the friendly skies. Now, I myself, I like United Airlines. I am a platinum flyer on United Airlines. I've flown them for years and Continental before uh, Continental was purchased by United. And um, I, I think United has a great product. I have nothing bad to say about United Airlines. But when they try to hypnotize me by repeatedly telling me that they are the friendly skies, I wonder how many times in my life I've heard that message. Thousands of times, probably. Maybe tens of thousands of times. I do not believe that United is any friendlier than any other airline. You know, uh, If I fly Delta or I fly American, there may be a few airlines that are particularly unfriendly. I'll accept that. You know, But in terms of, is this really an area of differentiation for United Airlines? I don't think so. And despite having told me that a credible number of times, I, I, I'm just cynical about it. I, I'm so cynical, I don't even think about my cynicism. I just don't even, don't even pay attention to it enough to believe. So that's the first reason, is when we're out there telling people about ourselves, very often they're not listening or they're not, or they're not believing us. The second reason is online reviews. So let me take a step back from that and say, if people don't believe what you say about yourself, what is it that they do believe? There's actually two things they believe. They believe their own experience. So, for example, I was talking about, uh, I don't believe that United is a friendly skies. But on a few occasions, I have flown Southwest Airlines. Not often, because just they're not often the airline that's going between the cities I'm flying between. But man, those people are friendly. If you've ever flown on Southwest Airlines, the staff is like, they're all so happy to be there. They're happy to see you. They're making jokes. They're making it a fun experience to fly on Southwest Airlines. If you ask me, What's an airline that's friendly? I would say Southwest Airlines, not United Airlines. Now, Southwest Airlines has never told me that they are friendly. I don't recall them ever having an ad about how friendly Southwest Airlines is, but they've given me that experience. So I believe it because I've experienced it. Now, that's not what I'm talking about now. I'm talking about online reviews. But the reason, I, you know, the, the point is there's two things people do believe, their own experience and credible reports of other people's experiences. Not the phony testimonial you put in your ad with a picture of somebody and a quote that says your product is the best thing since sliced bread. Since, of course, today's cynical customer knows that you cherry pick that person. That's probably a stock photo anyway. Lord, Lord knows you might have made that quote up. And even if none of those things are true, even if that really is how your customers feel and you didn't cherry pick that person and that really is that person, how's your the viewer of that ad supposed to know that? Most likely they still think it's BS. But if you go on Amazon and you see there's 600 reviews for a product and there's 500 five-star reviews and 100 four-star reviews and a few one and two-star reviews and you start to read what people are writing, 
people generally do give a fair amount of weight and credibility to that information, particularly when there's many reviews. And that's not just true for products that you might buy on um, Amazon. That's true for services you might read about on places like Angie's List or, uh, you know, things that you might, uh, you know, trip travel type of reviews that you might read someplace like um, TripAdvisor or restaurants. You might read someplace like Yelp. I mean, these days, for almost my, my, my wife is a college professor, and for anyone who knows the college scene, there's a site called RateMyProfessor.com, and RateMyProfessor.com is a place that college students can go and put their honest feedback and reviews of their college professors, and they, they have to rate them on like, like whether they know the subject, whether they interact well with students, whether they give fair grading, and actually they also rate them on hotness, which I always thought was kind of interesting. Um, so if you go on Rate My Professor, you can find my wife and see what her hotness rating is if you are so inclined. In any case, it's a good, it's, she has a good rating. So I, I wouldn't tell you if it wasn't the case. In any, in any case, what's my point? What is my point? My point is that people believe that stuff. That is believable and credible. So, um, and why does that undermine, why does, why does that make marketing not work well today? Well, the reason is because whatever you say about yourself is, is, is eclipsed a hundred thousand times over by people who are interested in learning more about you as a brand, they can just go find what real people say. And that voice speaks 10,000 times louder than yours in terms of telling, actually telling you know, the story and representing what your brand is really like. And so those online reviews take the place of anything that you might say about yourself largely, because very often they're more detailed and furthermore, they're more credible. So that's the impact of online reviews. Um, and then the last is availability. Now, how does availability mean that marketing works less well than it used to? Well, you know, there's a couple components to marketing. I like to think of marketing as, as being mainly three things. First of all, there's awareness of your existence. You let someone know, hey, uh, we're a new Chinese restaurant. We just opened up in town, okay? The second part of marketing is letting people know why they should come there. What's different about you? We have the we have award winning egg rolls and the you know whatever the the best service in in the world or whatever right. This is my this is your differentiation. This is why you should come to my Chinese restaurant. And lastly, there's a call to action. We're open from you know noon to eight p.m. every evening. Call one eight hundred Chinese restaurant for reservations or whatever. It is. I mean, this is the the skeleton, if you will, the basics of any kind of marketing. You need to let someone know what the heck it is, why they should choose you, and what they should do to either get more information or buy or make an appointment or what, you know, obviously depending on what your nature of your business is, it's going to vary. So in the old days when we didn't have digital, you know, maybe there was no, let's take another example. Let's say, let's say you're a collector of porcelain dolls, right? And well, let's say the closest store that sells collectible porcelain dolls is 50 miles away from where you live. And all of a sudden, a store selling porcelain dolls opens up, you know, 10 minutes away from you. All they have to do is let you know they exist. There is a porcelain doll store. You're like, oh my God, a porcelain doll store, only 10 minutes away from me, I'm gonna drive there. Just knowing that something exists was almost enough in many cases. If there was a, you know, a, a, maybe there's only one store in your town that sells clothing and now all of a sudden a second one opens up or it doesn't even have to be only in your town, you know, near where someone lived. Proximity was so important. And so if you were simply in a, in a certain space, a certain market, and you told people you existed, that was often enough. You got differentiation merely from your physical location. That's the whole real estate idea of location, location, location. And very often you could get people. So of course, it's people believe you when you say they, they you tell them you exist, right? Very few people would lie. Nobody would say, hey, we're a new Chinese restaurant in town. We just put an ad in the paper, but actually we're not. We're not a Chinese restaurant. We're not in town. We don't exist at all. We just advertise that we do. Of course, no one does that. So people believe you when they say you exist. And when your differentiation simply comes from your proximity, there's less to need to believe in order to be at least willing to check something. out. But of course, today, for many, many types of products and services, and there are exceptions, but for many types of products and services, because the internet provides endless aisles, because if you're interested in porcelain dolls, you go on the internet and there's endless websites that want to sell you porcelain dolls and eBay and all kinds of places you can go and find them at every price point, used, new, whatever. I don't know much about porcelain dolls, but I'm pretty confident that uh, you don't need to worry about whether there's a store 10 minutes from you or 50 minutes from you or whatever else, because you now have that availability, which means that just existing near you 
is no longer differentiating. In fact, it's the opposite because uh, I still have to drive 10 minutes to the store, whether, whereas everything on the, uh, you know, on the internet is right there on my phone or on my computer. So the taking away of the differentiation of proximity, at least in many cases, there are exceptions, right? If I need to find a chiropractor, well, you know, I'm not going to find a chiro- I'm not going to go on the internet, right, and find a chiropractor. I mean, I have to. I need somebody who is in physical proximity because I need to go there. So there are exceptions, but in most businesses, uh, it beca- has become much, much less important. And so, as a result, the the marketing goal of just letting people know that you exist or that you're having a sale or whatever else, because that's the thing. Even a sale, you can say, let's say there's three clothing stores in town and one of them's having a sale. Everyone might say, well, let's go check out the sale. But you don't really need the sale at your local store because you can just go on the internet and there's a million things on sale. So um, so that's the third reason. So just to summarize, the three reasons your marketing is probably not working the way it did in the good old days. Um, number one, people are more cynical than ever. And there's lots of studies that show that. Just Google that. Marketing cynicism. and it's studied all the time. The numbers are off the chart. Number two, they're ignoring what you say about yourself anyway because if they're interested in your business, they're going to go check out online reviews. And number three, they have so much choice that you really have to be able to prove that you are worth their dollars, that you're worth their attention. It's not enough to just say, hey, I'm near you. So these are the three reasons why marketing is much, much harder than it used to be. Now, of course, there are some things that make marketing easier in the digital age, like the ability to target people and all these different channels that we can choose to target people on. But these are three huge things that in many cases are making marketing not work well. And One of the things that I often talk about, and I want to just touch on here, is I'll put forth this idea. You know, for many years, I heard and many companies talk about this idea of our brand promise. This is our brand promise to our customer. And that's like United Fly the Friendly Skies, right? And what I want to suggest to you is the idea of the brand promise is dead. Because it's like if I have a friend who I think is 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 a perpetual liar, somebody who has zero credibility and I can't trust or believe them. And they tell me something, but they don't just tell it to me. They promise. Does that mean anything to me? Not really, because I know this person isn't to be believed. So it doesn't really matter if they promise it. Well, I hate to say it because it sounds a little like maybe sad, but that's kind of how most brands and corporations are perceived by consumers. And there are exceptions, but there's a very small percentage of exceptions. So by and large, if you're a major global bank that everyone's heard of, and you go out there and you say something and you make that your brand promise, that brand promise is not believed. So let's stop calling it a brand promise because we're kind of kidding ourselves. Now, that doesn't mean I don't think you should be thinking about what you stand for and what you mean, but you need to think of other ways to focus on getting your customer or your prospect to really believe your story of differentiation. It's not going to be enough to have a slogan or a tagline. By the way, Think of some of the most successful businesses in today's digital age. What is Google's slogan? Anyone know? I don't. I don't think they have a slogan. Um, what is Facebook's slogan? What is eBay's slogan? What is Uber's slogan? I'm not going to say none of these companies have ever had any kind of slogan. Maybe. I don't know. But I can't recall it. And so that just shows that even if they someone wrote one at some point, it's not in use. It's not like the classic marketing where we, we reiterate and we try to sort of hypnotize people into hearing our slogan and believing our, this idea of our brand promise. So the idea of brand promise is dead. And what you do, what I think you should do is switch from thinking about the idea of a brand promise to what I call a brand claim. A brand claim is very similar in some ways to what we would classically call a brand promise, which is to say, It's an articulation of what are we about as a company? What differentiates us as a company? Is it higher quality? Is it better customer service? Is it, you know, we believe in you? Is it, we get, we, you know, we're environmental, whatever the core of what you believe differentiate is that we have the best and crunchiest egg rolls in all of New York city, whatever you believe is the core differentiating component to why someone should do business with you and somebody, not somebody else. That may be what we previously called the brand promise, but what I want to do is I want to encourage you and your companies to restate what that is, and we're going to call it a brand claim. Now, what's the difference between a promise and a claim? The difference is how you expect the other person to respond. If I say something and I say that it's a promise, I kind of expect the other person to believe me, right? Because otherwise, they're questioning my credibility. So I assume if I promise something, they probably believe. 
But if I claim something, I, I don't necessarily think the other person believes me. You know, it's like, it's just, it's my assertion. And I know that they're probably, in fact, going to be skeptical of my claim. That's really how it works today. And the one benefit of even stating a brand claim, because you could argue, well, why even tell anyone what you stand for if they're not going to believe you? The one benefit is if you state a claim, they may be on the lookout to see whether that claim is true. It's like in a courtroom. If the, if the prosecutor says, you know, this man is guilty of murder, well, the jury might not believe the prosecutor initially, but the, the, the prosecutor is telling them, I'm going to prove it to you. And then, of course, the jury will determine whether the subsequent evidence proves it or doesn't prove it, but at least the jury knows what they're supposed to be looking for. That's the filter. That's the lens by which they're supposed to be looking at all the things that's going to come next. Well, if you tell people that you're the friendly skies, then when they fly your airline, they potentially are going to be on the lookout to see, are you particularly friendly? And if you are, and maybe they're going to notice it more than they would otherwise notice it. And then that brand quality of differentiation is going to be more believed by people. But of course, you could argue that's not really marketing now, is it, right? The claim is the marketing, but the rest is something else. But nevertheless, that's really, and that's going to kind of lead me into what I want to end our time here today with. But it's really not through marketing that we primarily impact the way our brand is perceived. The marketing, the claim can serve as a lens, something that focuses the person. But by the way, if you tell people that you're the friendly airline, and I apologize for just using this. It's a good, clean example. Again, I have nothing against United. I think United is a great airline in many ways. I, I mean that quite sincerely. And they're not a client of mine or anything like that. I fly them all the time. Uh, I'm just saying that this aspect of their marketing, I don't think is giving them a lot of mileage. That's all. I think there's other great things they do that give them mileage. But the bottom line is, um, if I don't, if you tell me that you're the friendly skies, and then I go on, I don't experience an unusually friendly experience then you've kind of reinforced my disbelief in whatever you say as a brand. And so you actually have at least a mildly negative impact because you made a claim that really turned out to largely not really be true. And even more so, if you do things that violate that claim, now you look like a hypocrite. And United did have this problem when a few years back, there was a huge news cycle about how there'd been a, a, an issue with a ticket and they wanted to bump someone off a flight. And anyway, they wound up, you probably remember the story, dragging somebody off an airplane. And I think that person might've gotten hurt. I can't remember the whole story precisely. And I don't know if that story would have, it probably would have still been news, but it might not have been as big news if United hadn't been out there for years telling everyone they were the friendly area, right? Because then obviously they're doing something unfriendly, even though I'm sure they do a million things that are not unfriendly. That's not typical of United, but nevertheless, this is the danger of creating a claim, which is then, when you, or if you violate that claim, people notice it more. Again, you've given people a lens to either look for where you are sort of uh, walking your talk or where you're not. So um, that's why though, I still think you should think about, and you should think about how strong of a claim you wanna make. You could choose as a company, like say someone like Google, to not really make a strong brand claim. In fact, many of the leading companies today, you'll notice they do very little marketing of, in a traditional sense at all. Certainly very little advertising. You don't see Google, maybe once in a blue moon you see something, but rarely do you see ads for Google, Amazon, Netflix occasionally if they have a big show coming out, but clearly Apple does some advertising, but not a lot compared to their size. You know, If you look at Apple's advertising budget relative to their revenue and compare it to other uh, companies that sell different types of consumer electronics, it's a tiny fraction because clearly Apple's main way of proving to you who they are and what they're about and why they're different isn't really through what we would classically call traditional marketing. Um, and I want to end with the thought, and, and you probably have already figured out where I'm going here. The thing that really impacts people today is experience. And, you know, this is my main area of focus in my career right now is working with companies around improving their customer experience and their digital customer experience. And of course, many of you are aware, I have a book that has the same name as this show, The Digi uh, Winning Digital Customers, The Antidote to Irrelevance. And that book goes through a step-by-step -step process for how anyone can help transform their company to be better aligned to creating customer love, customer delight, and ultimately you know, fulfilling a positive brand promise or brand claim in a way that will be believed and internalized. And many, many studies, including some of the data that I've shared in other live casts and in the book, show that those companies that, su that succeed in doing that, that succeed in creating a connection with their customers to really stand for something and prove to that customer that that's who they are, 
not through what they say. You know, it's like uh, you've probably heard the phrase, you know, uh, sh show, don't tell, right? You tell someone something, they don't believe it. But instead of focusing on telling them, focus on showing them, and then they're more likely to believe it. How do we show our brand promise or our brand claim in this day and age? It's largely through experience. When you give a person a positive experience, that is going to make a much bigger impact than any kind of marketing. And really, so the answer to me to most companies is not don't do any marketing. Think of marketing as a way of establishing a claim, but focus most of your energy and most of your attention around the experience so you can reinforce that claim and really create a strong connection to your customer. So, uh, and as I say in my book, I go through very much step-by-step -step how you go about figuring out what are the key things you need to change in your customer experience to be better aligned to your brand promise, and then how you go about the process of actually making those changes over time. So if you'd like to check out that book, uh, you can actually go to winningdigitalcustomers.com if you'd like, uh, and you can uh, get a, a, the first chapter of the book for free. And uh, of course, if you want the whole book, you can click there and you can buy it, uh, I think, at a discount on the website. And plus, you can get it on Amazon and Barnes & Noble and Apple Books and all those kind of places. So hopefully this has been helpful to you. Um, it's been interesting and fun for me to just think this through. Of course, there are some things that still do work in marketing, but if you're thinking about marketing the old way, you're probably having this experience that it doesn't work as well as it used to, and perhaps this information has been useful to help diagnose why and make changes so that your marketing or your efforts to engage your customer can be awesome. So as always, thanks for watching, thanks for listening, and keep transforming.